a series of events on data protection. And we have a very special welcome today to John Frank, who is Microsoft's Vice President of EU Government Affairs. John has had a very distinguished and continues to have a distinguished career in Microsoft. Um, he leads now Microsoft teams in Brussels, but also in the European national capitals on EU issues. So he's very familiar not only with the Commission's view on things, but also individual member states' views. Um, and we're very pleased that he's talking today on a public policy agenda for cloud computing and key issues, I think, around trust, responsibility and inclusion. John, we look forward to your presentation. Thank, Thank you. you. So I'm going to give a context for what's happening from a technological point of view and why it's such an interesting and exciting time. Uh, I'm going to talk about the social and political context in which we are operating and then talk about an agenda for public policy uh, opportunities. The, uh, the cloud computing is, is expanding hugely. We have Europe's largest data center just a few miles away from here. Uh, and in fact, it's, we call it a data center, but in fact it's 20 data centers. Uh, and, you know, sort of a logical unit of, I don't know, perhaps a million CPUs per data center. And in response to the increasing demand across Europe, we're building data centers as fast as we can. That demand is driven first by cost. Let me just tell a, a brief story. When uh, In my previous role I, uh, uh, in Redmond, Washington, where corporate headquarters are, I had a role where I was chief of staff uh, and deputy general counsel for legal and corporate affairs. And the departmental IT group reported into me. And we got a budget from the corporate IT people every year, about $10 million uh, for our departmental projects. And then <clears throat> by the time they deducted all the cost for updating the hardware, upgrading the software, and patching and maintaining, I was left with a budget of about $3 million for projects. And I thought, this kind of sucks. Um, and we set out to essentially move all of our departmental applications to the cloud. And today, we do that. We've got about a $2 million cost to Azure, um, our online service for enterprises. But at scale, in cloud computing, the Azure people, they can upgrade, patch, maintain, and keep everything up to date at scale at a much lower cost. And so I've got a lot more money then to spend on projects in terms of developing new software, new programs, and improving existing programs. So the, the, the most compelling thing initially about the cloud is cost. But then there's, as a practical matter, not every, I'm not gonna make the claim for every cloud computing center, but, but our service, we believe we can keep your data more secure than you can possibly do yourself. Whether you're a law firm, an NGO, or a major enterprise, um, you know, it's a major challenge to remain secure. Not only can we do those things about patching and maintaining and keeping your software up to date so that you don't have vulnerabilities, but the cloud enables us to do some things that no organization could do by itself. And so there's something called advanced threat protection, which we offer on email. And when an attachment comes in, the traditional way to do it is to scan for viruses. Now viruses are known malware codes. The problem with the approach of having malware scans is that the malware creator just has to tweak things just a little bit and suddenly you get a false negative. Um, what we can do in the cloud with advanced threat protection is essentially open every attachment, look to see does it make any unusual calls. You know, when you open a Word document, we know what's supposed to happen. If it's doing something else and calling another part of the computing system, we identify that as malware. And we immediately know and can protect 
each and every of our customers around the world against that particular threat. And that's the kind of thing you can do in the cloud that you couldn't do as a, as a standalone enterprise. But the really exciting part of the cloud is the advanced technologies that it enables. Um, <clears throat> things like voice recognition. You know, you can now just, if you develop an app, you can just use our voice recognition as a service. Uh, you don't have to figure it out yourself. It's, a, it's an API on Azure. Um, you can use data analytics and machine learning for your enterprise without having to create a whole IT department of PhD computer scientists to figure out how to do this. In fact, we make it, um, you know, we make it so simple that you get startup companies today that, that have 20 employees that have a billion dollar market cap because they're using the cloud to create their company. One example I want to talk about is Rolls-Royce. At the Hanover Mesa big industrial fair, the topic was Industry 4.0, how information technology is transforming the industrial capacity and production. And they brought to our stand at Hanover giant Trent um, jet engine. I mean, these things are really big. And they had it opened up, and you could see all the sensors on the jet engine. And these engines today have got telemetry that are bounce off the satellite down to our data centers around the world. And in real time, we monitor the performance of their jet engines. Now, we're not in the jet engine business, um, but, but we can have our data scientists work with them to answer questions they think are useful and valuable to them. And so in the first instance, knowing when one of those parts is likely to fail prematurely enables them to schedule a replacement in advance of it failing. And just as part of their scheduling, oh, this plane's going to be in Chicago a week from Tuesday. We'll replace the part when it's there. We've got the part. And so that's, that's a big help to sort of an airline who's running these jet engines. But also, from the machine learning, we were able to, with our data scientists working with them, figure out how they could reduce fuel consumption across the board by 4%. Now, if you're running an airline, your fuel costs are one of the biggest costs that you have. And if you can, if you can reduce that by essentially teaching your planes and your pilots to fly more efficiently, that's a huge advantage for Rolls-Royce. And so those are the kind of the data analytics that, that companies will be using to turn their products into services and create more value for their customers. Uh, and so that's the kind of thing you can do with the cloud that you couldn't do on your own. Um, as we think about the cloud, one thing to note is it's a fundamentally different relationship with our customers. We're not just selling technology. We're hosting their data. And you know, we, we sometimes talk, we become a bank, and we need to hold people's data safely. But it's different because banks, if they lose $1,000, they can just, it's fungible, another $1,000. We lose your data, you can't, you know, it's not fungible. It's a real problem. So maintaining security and trust and protecting the integrity of data becomes a hugely important project for us. Now, let me just say a few words about the social and political context in which this cloud evolution is taking place. I think you'll all agree that there is deep dissatisfaction among many people in Europe and the United States with our political institutions, international trade, and globalization. The rise of populism and nationalism across Europe and in the United States is shaping our political realities today. Um, eight years after the financial crisis, most people have not been able to get back to where they were economically before the crisis. Um, Comparing 2014 household incomes across advanced economies, 
McKinsey Global Institute found that 65 to 70 percent of incomes were flat or down from 2005. Um, in 2014, the real median income for U.S. households was $53,657. In real terms, that level was first reached in 1989, 25 years ago. Among a lot of people in our societies, they're not finding, they're not seeing, feeling, enjoying the benefits of the new economy that technology is creating. Um, in the U.S., the manufacturing sector in particular declined dramatically after the financial crisis. Uh, the good news is manufacturing came back. The bad news is the jobs didn't. Robotics and computerization greatly reduced the number of jobs in the sector. Uh, in 2013, Oxford professors Carl Frey and Michael Osborne wrote a study about um, the propensity or the risk of jobs uh, to automation. And they found that 47% of U.S. jobs were at risk of being lost to automation. And it correlates strongly with, with education um, and, and hourly wages. And so if your hourly wage is less than $20 an hour, they said there's an 82% probability of your job being lost to automation. Now, of course, these numbers are, you know, in a dynamic world, things change. But, but the economic effects of this new world are going to have, continue to have profound social implications. You know, the, the phrase is, you have to be smarter or cheaper than a machine to have a job. And as we think about the new world ahead, I think it's particularly important to think about the social and political context and ensuring that people feel included in the opportunities that our new economy presents and not left behind. So I think we as a company in particular have been focusing on why is it that Germany and Austria have a youth unemployment rate that's similar to the adult unemployment rate. They've got great apprenticeship programs. Can we model those? And in fact, we're, we're trying to bring some of those programs to our home state of Washington to try to see if we can do things to reduce youth unemployment rate and create people who are capable of higher skilled, higher wage jobs. We're also promoting um, digital education, giving people a chance to spend more time learning some computer science. There's a great program called Hour of Code, uh, started by a Microsoft alum, Hadi Partovi. Uh, and it's just sort of an online thing. And once a year, there's a big campaign to get kids to go online and just try coding for an hour. And I was at some meetings with Hadi, and I came home and said to my, my kids, tonight, let's do Hour of Code. And it's, it's, you know, it's fairly simple kind of things, but Turns out my daughter really liked it. In fact, my daughter, that was the first time she did anything like that. She's now a computer science major. Um, just giving kids an opportunity to open new windows into the world can help them pursue new ideas. So I think that broadly thinking, as we think about education today and skills for our kids, we ought to be thinking about what are the models that we see around the world that can create better paying jobs for the less educated in our society. Um, now, Dublin, as the digital capital of Europe, um, I think has some great advantages and some big challenges. Um, you've thought very carefully about creating telecom pairings and, and infrastructure here so that it's a great uh, infrastructure for cloud computing. You're also extremely fortunate to have uh, very cool climate weather. Um, you know, in our data center between just sort of using natural air and some passive cooling, kind of swamp cooler things, we can we can minimize the amount of time we actually have to run the cooling systems on our data centers to you know, 
a very small number of hours a year. So the Irish, uh, the Irish weather, it's blue skies today, but it's, you know, it's, it, is a, it is a significant advantage to you. Um, but there's some, some things that are left undone. You know, and, and privacy, security, and government access are, are key issues. Um, and I want to spend a few minutes talking about the challenges there. Um, as the keeper of data for our company, for our customers, we are very protective of when government should get access to it. And so after the Snowden disclosures, we filed a lawsuit in the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court so that we could disclose more information about how many orders we receive. And they're all on things like Hotmail accounts. We don't have enterprises data being requested. We've never had a FISA request for an enterprise account. But we were able to report that it's about 16 to 18,000. It kind of varies um, of accounts that are being monitored pursuant to the NSA. And, and you know, it's all pursuant to uh, court orders. Uh, and when you consider we've got hundreds of millions of email accounts for Hotmail and LiveMail and Outlook.com, it's actually it's a very, very small percentage. Um, but we also have looked at our European customers, and especially organizations. They, they don't want the NSA or the US courts to get access to their data. They, you know, it's not surprising. Europeans want European privacy law to protect them. And, and so I was, uh, we began looking at how do we deal with some of the cross-border issues, and that led us to file a lawsuit when we received a search warrant for an email account that was for an individual, a Hotmail account, and it was stored here in our Dublin data center. And, and we argued that the search warrant provision of the Stored Communications Act did not reach outside the United States. And, and so the, the legal history of a search warrant is that it's author, authorization and license from a court to the sheriff to go do something that would otherwise be illegal, to go to that building, break down the door, and seize evidence. Now that is by nature territorial limited. You can't immunize your sheriff to cross the border into another country and go do that. Right? So um, it's, it is a territorial act. The US statute did not, we don't, you know, there was no intent from Congress when the, when the statute was passed more than tw 20 years ago to make it extraterritorial. And so we lost at the trial court, um, and we, but we've eventually won at the Second Circuit Court of Appeals in New York. And we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, the Department of Justice has filed a motion asking the Second Circuit to rehear it uh, on banc, sort of a grand chamber. It's been well over a month since that request was made. We've not heard anything from the court. We take that as a positive sign but we don't know what's going to happen to that. Um, we are anticipating that the Department of Justice will, take it, will ask the Supreme Court to take it. And if they do, uh, it'll be very important for industry to continue, for industry, customers, and governments to continue to support us. Uh, in the Second Circuit litigation, uh, we were deeply appreciative of the Irish government's willingness to file an amicus brief setting out concerns about the case. Um, we were also, we had um, amicus briefs from uh, about 50 computer scientists um, and about 50 different companies and trade associations in the United States ranging everything from the American Civil Liberties Union on the left to the American Chamber of Commerce on the right and everybody broadly in support of our position. Um, we think it's incredibly important to, to continue to advance that litigation. 
but the litigation doesn't really solve it, solve problems. It, 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 it creates an opportunity to create some new laws uh, because the United States is going to want to do something and Ireland, coming back, needs to do something as well. Uh, after the Paris and, and Brussels attacks, we receive emergency requests from governments for email of, of accounts associated with the terrorists. And under the US statute, we are able to comply with those because when we have a well-founded belief that disclosure of our customers' data is necessary to protect human life or prevent serious bodily injury, we are authorized but not required by law to be able to disclose that to governments. Uh, here in Ireland, uh, the Data Protection Commissioner uh, a few years ago in a report concluded that that same principle was applicable under Irish law. Um, and so that, that is incredibly important. And you know, after those attacks, and the Paris attacks, we were able to respond within 45 minutes. But it's a bit of a circular route because the French government went to the FBI in Washington, D.C. The FBI came to us at our Seattle headquarters three time zones away. We supplied the information to the FBI, and they returned, supplied it to the authorities in France. Um, with data stored in Dublin, we need to have some system in place so that the authorities in Paris can, under the right circumstances, get data stored in Dublin. Um, and, and so I think there, you know, there's three broad interests at stake. There's security, there's privacy, and there's sovereignty. Um, security, we understand. I don't think there's any function more important for a government than keeping its citizens safe. Privacy is nuanced. There's a couple aspects of it I want to call out. It's not just the individual, you know, my private personal email account, but it's also our, our organizations. And so, you know, I think we host the Europe, uh, we, we host the British Parliament's email system here in Dublin. And they want to know that the Dublin government and the Washington DC government are not going to access their emails. Um, we need the system so that corporations can feel secure that the, the existing rules that apply on paper will also protect them in the cloud. And so if you're a general counsel, I mean, one of the things that you prepare for and you worry about is a dawn raid from competition authorities or another regulator. Now, it, going through a dawn raid is not a fun experience, but people fear a dawn raid they didn't even know took place when government came in and captured their data without them knowing it. So we need organizational rules as well as privacy rules for individuals. The third aspect on sovereignty is where it can be worked out, but it's going to require work and cooperation. So the, our response to the US government on the warrant case was you have a mutual legal assistance treaty with the government of Ireland. Use it. Um, and they said, well, we don't have to use it. We don't want to use it. We want to be able to unilaterally get the, get the information. Now, if you're, the Dublin, if you're in Dublin and, and the government's saying, well, you know, we, we agreed to a process by which you can get evidence that's, that's here in Ireland, but now you just want to unilaterally take it, you know, it's, it does feel like an infringement of sovereignty. And sovereignty can be shared, but it's done by consent and agreement. You can have a bilateral agreement, um, but you need to work through those issues so that governments can accept and put the right parameters on that intrusion on their sovereignty. And so I think for <clears throat> there's a few different options for how Dublin can take this forward. And I, and I will say the Irish government needs to be a leader because it has the most at stake at ensuring that Dublin remains and Ireland remains a major digital capital. And, and so you can think about, could we have some harmonization at the European Union level? There's pluses and minuses. 
Uh, first of all, it's a big group. Secondly, law enforcement is not directly part of the competence or of limited competence for the European institutions. Um, but privacy is. And, and so potentially with privacy aspects, one could think about creating the kind of framework that the US has with the Stored Communications Act. Secondly, um, you could think about just a multilateral treaty outside the European Union, so you don't have to deal with the, the full 28 to begin with, and you don't have to worry about the competence of the European institutions um, or the fact that one of the leading economic partners will be leaving Europe. Um, and so you could think about a bilateral or multilateral agreement um, that sets these things out that, that deals with not just the, the, the challenge of giving evidence that you can use in a court for a trial, but information that can be used in real time for an ongoing investigation. And so those are, that, you know, that kind of agreement's possible. Underneath it, under that scenario, you probably need domestic legislation. And the Irish government, I think, can probably address these issues in a way that best suits the Irish economy and Irish interest by pursuing domestic legislation. It can frame up the, the right privacy interest, and it can define how and when it gives access to other governments uh, in a way that Irish unilaterally decides. So I think that there's different ways forward, but I think it's not just an opportunity, but, but really an imperative for Ireland to move forward on those things. The privacy shield is another privacy-related topic. Um, We've, as a company, and me personally, have been strong advocate, strongly advocating for the privacy shield. Um, and I think for the first time, the US government and the European Union institutions work through in a great deal of detail an understanding of each other's laws. And, and so if, if the original safe harbor was signed off on and stuck in a manila folder, uh, or actually they're blue paper folders in Brussels. Um, but if it was, you know, this is a completely different situation. There are extensive um, assurances and guarantees. There are extensive letters uh, from the Director of National Intelligence, from the Secretary of Commerce, from the Secretary of State, um, that detail how U.S law works in terms of surveillance and privacy protections that, that I believe go very far to addressing the concerns raised in the safe harbor agreement. But there's also something else, which is there's an annual review. And so there can be ongoing discussions about perceived gaps and improvements that can be made to the agreement. So I believe it's, it does have a, an updating mechanism uh, it is based upon a much, much more detailed analysis of U.S. law. And um, so I believe that, that it deserves support. And the Digital Rights Ireland, I know, has filed a, a claim uh, in Luxembourg challenging the validity of it. Um, and you know, we'll see how the court, court handles that. Um, as, as a company, um, especially, you know, sophisticated company, we, we, can, we can do planning scenarios where, where we can find other means of, of, um, of complying um, with international transfers requirements. But smaller companies or universities that have students taking massive online courses, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of users for whom the privacy shield is, is, is very, very important. And it's one of the few successes we've had in the transatlantic discussions in recent years. And so I think it's just from a macro political point of view, uh, it's important to have success preserving it. Um, another area is uh, to raise and is cybersecurity. We've got um, the NIS directive, which was recently adopted in Brussels, the Network Information Security Directive, I believe. Um, 
and again, because Dublin is where the major technology companies are located, and the General Data Protection Regulation and the NIS Directive have a country of you know, headquarters principle, the Irish regulators on, on network security and on privacy will be front and center. And they will be controlling most of the major activity across Europe. And so the NIS directive is, is, is both an opportunity and a challenge. Ideally, we'll find countries looking for a way to have a common approach as opposed to going at their own and having a, uh, inventing their own approaches to defining cybersecurity. The Italian uh, National Security Agency uh, has, has been quite interesting because they, they decided that rather than spend the next two years trying to define a cybersecurity regulation, they would start with um, some of the U.S. cybersecurity frameworks and just you know, tweak and augment those. Um, we're hopeful that the Irish uh, authorities will, will look for ways to, in the long term, have a harmonized approach so that you know, it's good regulation, but it's regulations that work for companies that, that have presence in multiple jurisdictions. Um, and so security, privacy, lawful access, those are, are key areas for the digital industries, and I think key, uh, key issues for, for Ireland is the digital capital for Europe. And so um, happy to take questions, have discussions. Feel free to, to uh, give me your, your point of view. And uh, I would like to thank the Institute for, for the invitation to be here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Joe.